After the flood, Noah lived another 350 years. In the pre-flood environment, long lifespans were normal for at least two possible reasons. One, they were close to the genetic perfection of the first man and the first woman. Secondly, the pre-flood environment likely was akin to a greenhouse, with a water canopy encircling the earth, filtering out harmful ultraviolet rays and providing an ideal environment for plants and animals. Post-flood earth was quite different. The topography had changed, but the land still provided for farming. The sons of Noah obeyed God's command to populate the earth, and they themselves had sons and daughters. Nimrod, meaning rebel, was a great grandson of Noah, and he grew to be a mighty warrior on the earth. At this time, all of mankind had one common language, but instead of obeying God's command to spread throughout the earth, they stopped at a fertile plain that was called Shinar, or Babylon. Let us build a city, a tower that reaches to the heavens. We will make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the earth. The great Nimrod will lead us. There are plenty of materials with which to build this city. Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. We will use brick instead of stone to build this great structure. And we will use the tar that is here for the mortar. We need no god to rule over us, nor do we need the ancient rules of my great-grandfather, Noah. This great city will be the center of the earth. All people can come here to worship, and Nimrod will rule over us. He will be our ruler, our high priest. Great Nimrod, he is a god. So construction began on this new center of worship. They began to build a great tower to touch heaven itself. Most likely, this was a large ziggurat where they could worship stars and created things rather than the Creator Himself. The Lord came down to see both the city and the tower that the men were building. If as one people they have begun to do this, then nothing will be impossible for them. Let us confuse their language so they will not be able to understand each other. Von was für einen Unsinn sprichst du? Ajutați-mă să înțeleg ceea ce întreabăm. Faites de la place à l'autre homme pour regarder ça. Quit speaking that strange tongue. Get out of my sight. What is going on? Don't you understand me? Those who spoke new languages could only understand each other. As a result, work on the tower stopped and the people scattered throughout the earth as God intended. Lone Ranger and Tonto were once passing through a canyon, and uh, as they were pa passing through, um, gathered together on, on both sides, all of a sudden there were uh, American Indians on both sides, warriors with, on horses dressed for battle. The Lone Ranger turned to Tonto and said, what are we going to do? Tonto replied, what do you mean, we, white man? <laughs> you probably heard that before, but I thought, sadly, you know, that kind of describes the kind of unity that a lot of Christians subscribe to. Um, convenient unity, <laughs> unless it seems to be not so, uh, so convenient, and then all of a sudden you're so ready to break that unity. We're going to continue um, our message that we started a couple Sundays ago um, about unity. It was entitled, Divided We Stand, United we fall. And the whole point of this strange sounding title, which sounds counter to the saying we, we often say, is that, that not all unity is good. And uh, the Tower of Babel proves the fact that not all unity is good. And we talked about last time how a lot of things that we often think are just inherently good are not always good in every circumstance, and unity is included in that. Um, there are different kinds of unity. There's right 
unity and wrong unity. There's a holy unity and unholy unity. Um, there's integrity. There's conspiracy, which is a kind of unity if you think about it. And there are corrupt versions of unity. We call it uniformity when everyone's kind of doing the same thing uh, only. Or union when people are, are brought together, but they really don't share um, things that are the most important to them. And then there's even unanimity, which is a uh, unity of agreement, but not unity in anything else. A lot of times we agree to things, but we don't actually bind to them. And so the Word of God um, is the only standard, as we talked about, we've been talking about for a long time, and, and the whole year of restoration that the, the Bible is the only source of standard, the only plumb line, the only measuring rod that can be used to discern what is good and what is not good. Uh, good versus uh, to discern good from the evil. And so as we talked about opinions and consensus and traditions and gut feelings are the absolute worst ways to discern. But unfortunately, uh, we as humans want to discern that way rather than to go to God's discernment. Um, and a lot of times we don't really have to discern. What we have to do is uh, comprehend. We have to understand the things that God uh, has uh, told us. And so um, if you think about it, it's a much better place to be because God is in a much better uh, position to be able to judge these things than we are. So our job is simply to, to understand the judgments God has given. Um, but our pride, our pride causes us to trust ourselves, or maybe trust other people's ideas and think that they're better than uh, even the things that God says. And so every man and woman um, today, even today, still builds towers. And we talked about that and the fact that towers represent the efforts in our life. And there's all kinds of places that we build uh, towers. And the, the two parts that I've been bringing out here in um, the Tower of Babel is that there is a right place to build and then a wrong place to build. There are really two kingdoms, two kingdoms to talk about. One kingdom is described as uh, Babel. Um, the kingdom that's iconic figure is Nimrod, which comes from the Genesis uh, 11 account, uh, 10 and 11 account. Um, the one who's the mighty man, who has all the worldly characteristics. Uh, and uh, then there's the other kingdom, which is uh, called Zion. And the iconic figure in that kingdom is, is Abraham. And, uh, and these two kingdoms could not be uh, more different um, than anything uh, in the entire world. And we have a, ch a choice. Each and every one of us have a choice where we're going to build our towers and which kingdom we're going to build them. We have individual towers of our life, but we also have the collaborative towers. Um, the Tower of Babel was a collaborative tower, wasn't it? They all came together and God confused their language to divide them, to keep them from doing something that was ultimately going to be harmful to them. That was the united we fall part. And eventually, because God divided them up and sent them out and spread them out the way they were supposed to be, um, they were able to stand. And so the collaborative towers, uh, such as marriage, uh, when a man and a woman come together to build um, their life together, or uh, an entire family is a tower. Uh, people coming together to build something that's certainly needed in our uh, society today. Uh, a church is a tower. It's a community, a spiritual community that's supposed to be built together. And then, of course, the entire community that we live in is also a kind of tower, a collaborative tower. People coming together to build something. The only question is, where are we going to build it? Where are we going to build our marriage? Where are we going to build our family? Where are we going to build our community? And where are we going to build our church and what kingdom we'll be spending our time. Um, but not everyone cares about uh, the unity the way it, it should be. It reminds me of the uh, time I, I got lost and I was driving um, and I really, this is the days before GPS and so it was easy to get lost. Actually uh, I had uh, some of the various earliest versions of GPS and that wasn't always a good thing because it was still a developing technology at least as far as uh, widespread use and a lot of times it was just plain old wrong. Uh, but I, I got to a place that I got really confused in the middle of nowhere because I came to a fork in the road and both uh, directions had the town list that I was trying to get to. I can't figure out know, how am I going to get to this. So I, I, I chose one. I drove a little bit and I saw um, right near the road it was a farmer um, standing inside the road. So I thought, I might, you know, he's around here. I'll probably ask him. So I stopped and pulled over and rolled down the window. I just kind of yelled out to him. I said, uh, does it matter uh, which road I take to get to town? He said, well, it don't matter to me. Uh, <laughs> you know, so uh, some people th think that way about unity. You know, it's just it's not really a priority uh, for me to, to really concentrate. I got other things, got other fish to fry, other focuses in my life. And so we just don't really care about those things. And in fact, 
Um, there are some people who actually work against such things, that they work against unity. Uh, it's like the, uh, the family reunion that happened uh, recently where they had a photographer come in to take pictures of everyone and, and uh, they, they had one, one of those nice setups with the digital cameras and, and after they took the pictures she had a little TV so everyone would come and look at the pictures she had taken and, and uh, one of the people that was attended the reunion went to go look with the photographer at all the different pictures. She was looking at them and, and she, boy, she didn't like the way she looked on, on camera, you know, and she said, man, uh, man, look at my face. I look so old there. Some wrinkles. You think you might be able to do something to kind of smooth that out so I don't look so, so wrinkly? He said, well, I, I think I, I probably can do that. And, uh, and man, uh, I look like I'm about 30 pounds overweight, you know. I, I, can, you, can you take about those uh, 30 pounds uh, off of me? And he said, well, I, I suppose I can do that. And he says, can you put those 30 pounds on my sister? Can you do that? Is that something, you know, you might be able... Uh, some people just work against unity, you know, I mean, anything they can do uh, to lift themselves up and tear other people down. That's, of course, not unity at all. Now, the text, uh, again, this morning will be primarily from uh, Genesis 11, um, and those are the, the first nine verses, and you'll need your Bible to, to see all of those, and I'm not going to read through them, but I am going to summarize them. We've looked at this before, um, but if you weren't here, I do want to kind of bring you up to speed to, to get you, or even just because it's been a couple weeks, because we had the, uh, the outreach last week, just kind of get you back to the place where we left off last week about these two kingdoms and where you're going to spend your life building. Uh, and so uh, ge really Genesis 10 through 12 is, is the primary text today. Um, and uh, we're, we're going to learn from the descendants of Noah. And uh, a as, as that video kind of displayed, and I know that was uh, kind of a, uh, I guess the, um, a good way to describe that video this morning. So it was epic, you know, it was like, it was really kind of maybe uh, exaggerated, maybe some of the, the graphics, but the, the content actually was excellent. It's probably one of the best videos I've ever seen described. A lot of things that were in there that uh, were well discerned from the text. And so I was pretty impressed with it. So even though it was a little, uh, it was animated, of course, and it might've been a little bit exaggerated and, and some of the, how the characters look, they almost look non-human. <laughs> um, but, you know, the truth is that, uh, uh, what that tower represents was beginning to be brought out of that. So here's the truth that I want us to see today. Here's the, what I usually call the proposition. But the truth I want to expound on and continue expanding, uh, expounding on is that if we do not humbly seek holy unity, if we do not humbly seek a holy unity, we will end up in an unholy alliance. That's exactly what happened in the Tower of Babel because they were not seeking the, a righteous unity. They ended up with unrighteous unity and that will happen to us if we don't seek it correctly. And so we began looking at three contrasts last time. Uh, the first contrast we looked at uh, was the difference between the two kingdoms was the, was the contrast or the difference in cause. And uh, so the cause, I did, here's a summary uh, slide, this one and the next one of, of the, the, the difference in cause. The first difference or the cause or the motivation in one kingdom represented by Nimrod, when it comes to reputation, he said, I'm going to make, let us make a name for ourselves." Nimrod had already made a name for himself. You can read about that in Genesis 10. He was a mighty man. He was a mighty, mighty warrior. Every knew, everyone knew he's the grandson as, of uh, Noah. Everyone knew who Nimrod was and uh, they wanted him to be king. They exalted him up. And so one of the first things he says as king is let's, let's make a name for ourselves. And so that was uh, the, the kingdom um, motivation there is let's do it for ourselves. For a Abraham um, was seeking uh, God to make a name for him. Now that's a big difference. Making a name for yourself versus God making a name for you is one of the key differences in the motivations of these two kingdoms. Um, in fact, in Genesis 12, 2, it says the very thing to Abraham. God says, I will make a nation, uh, I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. That was what was said to Abraham or to Abram there. And then in chapter 11, verse 4, uh, you see the quote there where Nimrod says, let's make a name for ourselves. Uh, the second difference that we covered um, last time was um, in the motivation was the sovereignty. In other words, there's a difference between who's in charge in these two kingdoms. Uh, in in uh, man's kingdom, in Nimrod's kingdom, in, in Babel, uh, of course, um, they wanted Nimrod to be in charge, but ultimately they wanted one nation over God. Um, whereas in the other kingdom, Zion, uh, led by the iconic figure um, Abraham, it's one nation under God. And of course, we all know what our uh, country was supposed to be. It's one nation under God. But it's, it's, uh, it's a decision. It's 
a motivation of control. Who's in charge? Who do we want to lead us? And you might remember um, uh, the, the, the Old Testament text talking about the fact that God always wanted to be their God, the Jews, and they chose instead, no, thank you, God, thank you, but no, thank you. We want a king like all the other kings, and they uh, therefore accepted, because uh, God said, well, why don't you take this guy over here? His name is Saul. He's, a, he's the kind of king that you're looking for. He's just like all those other worldly kings, and that's exactly what Saul turned out to be. Um, so, the sovereignty in the kingdom of uh, Babylon is the, is the idea that we have to have, uh, be responsible for our own safety. We have to take care uh, of ourselves, our safety in numbers, so let's stay all together here. Let's uh, have some security. We're going to build this tower. We're going to talk about the tower this morning here in a minute. Uh, build this tower up here, and uh, there's a lot of things this tower can accomplish. Not only can we rise it up high to the heavens, um, but also maybe if there's another worldwide flood again, uh, we'll have a place where we can uh, have refuge. And uh, ultimately, we want to be in control of ourselves. And uh, God was judging the world because we wouldn't obey him, but maybe we can take care of ourselves and not worry about what God says. That was the motivation of the sovereignty in the kingdom of Babel. But in Zion, on the other hand, Abraham, this one nation under God, um, in verse 16 um, of chapter 11 of, uh, of Hebrews, it says this about Abraham. Looking back, he says, but as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. And therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he prepared for them uh, a city. So Abraham wanted uh, a city whose builder and maker was God, uh, rather than being in charge of themselves. So Abraham uh, wants one nation under God. Nimrod wants one nation uh, over God. And so there is, a, uh, we talked about last time, making a name for ourselves. Who's making a name? When you're building your tower of your life, are you making a name for yourself or are you wanting God to make a name uh, for you? Completely different, 180 degree diametrically opposed motivations in these two kingdoms. Now let's move on. Now that we summarized last time, let's move on to the second and third contrasts. And the second one is the building components. As we're building towers in Babylon or building towers in Zion, what materials are we using? Now, that uh, tower they were building um, is what in Hebrew is called a migdal, which is uh, most likely something, as the, the video showed, was uh, like a ziggurat. It wasn't a, uh, a great depiction of a ziggurat, but a ziggurat basically is a quadrilateral pyramid. It is a four-sided uh, pyramid, um, and the top, unlike the, the, the great pyramids of Giza in Egypt, there's a couple key differences. Um, one is that there's a, uh, the, the whole purpose of a ziggurat is to be an elaborate staircase. Um, whereas, of course, the, uh, the Egyptian pyramids, the Great Pyramid of Giza, is uh, a tomb, essentially, and it's got chambers and, and the tallow inside in certain places, whereas a ziggurat is a solid structure. There's not, there's no, you don't go inside a ziggurat. It's just an elaborate staircase. And so uh, you might have a temple or something on top of a ziggurat, but all the, this structure is, and they have a lot of these, by the way, in South America too, um, and uh, the, the, the Mayan people and things like that also built ziggurats. Uh, these, uh, and they had their temples on top of them. So there's an elaborate staircase. But uh, notice here, um, by the way, a lot of people think by studying the text that Jacob's ladder may have been something that looked like a, a ziggurat, because the word there doesn't literally mean a ladder. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. The idea of a ziggurat was you, you go up high uh, for a variety of reasons. Maybe it's to become closer to your God. Maybe it's a place where your God can come down and see you. And it's interesting the things that happen here in this text when they're building, building up this great um, uh, tower that God actually does come down. Of course, God doesn't have to come down to see things, but he does so. In other words, you're, you're building a tower because you want God to come down? Well, I'll just come, come on down and see what y'all are doing. And uh, let's check it out. And, uh, let's, and this is what he found. He found that they were building something that had a particular foundation. When we're talking about building materials, let's talk about what it's built of. In the kingdom of Babel, led by Nimrod, he was building his foundation based on human ingenuity. Now, the Tower of Babel, the text actually says, was made with kiln-fired bricks. Now, there's two things that's kill, that distinguish kiln-fired bricks. Number one, they're, they're very, um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time ancient, uh, studying ancient brick technology just to learn a little bit about these bricks that they talked about, because they specifically said fire-burnt bricks. 
Um, number one, a lot of t times buildings or structures were made out of natural stone. So they would cut stone out and put it together. And uh, that's a technology that lasted for literally millennia. I mean, uh, back where I lived in Virginia, um, when we go out towards the, the horse farms, in fact, the horse farm Tracy grew up on was surrounded by a stone wall. <laughs> and they literally have today, in the 21st century, stone masons, craftsmen who come out and still puzzle those stones together uh, to put those walls together. And it's amazing how sturdy and how long they last these stone walls just by putting um, stones together. Some of them have zero binder to them, not even uh, no, no pitch, no concrete, nothing that sticks them together. It's just the mere fact of putting these, uh, puzzling these uh, stones together. But they didn't do that. Uh, plus, of course, there were, were bricks, um, like they made in Egypt. Um, they will eventually make in Egypt. Um, but when the, when the Israelites were in Egypt, remember, they, uh, they tread out the bricks. They mixed the clay with the straw until uh, Pharaoh got mad at them and took the straw away, because it was harder to make the bricks without the straw. If you can imagine just stomping in a, in a pit of clay all day long to, to mix up this clay, that's what the slaves did. Then cut the bricks out, let them dry in the sun. That's one way to make a brick. It makes a pretty decent brick, but it's not the same thing as a kiln fire brick. If you go down here to town and you go to the pottery store and uh, they, they, they take the, the mud and they construct something, um, whatever you want to, to uh, paint, and you take the ceramic and you paint it the way you want to, and then they take your creation and then they put it in a kiln and they fire it. And when they fire it, it makes it uh, immeasurably strength, uh, stronger. I'm sure it's measurable, but uh, in my mind, it makes it a lot more uh, strong when they kiln, put it in a kiln. And, uh, and so, of course, the fact that they were going to take the time. I mean, imagine this huge, massive structure, hundreds of feet high. And each brick, they have to take the mud, they have to form it, they have to, uh, maybe they had a form of some kind, and they put it together, and once it dried, they put it, each one in a kiln in a high heat to make those bricks so hard. Think about how hard they were trying to make this foundation. They're using, I mean, the best technology of the third millennium BC um, to build this great tower of theirs. Now, why do I tell you all that? <laughs> because that's what happens when you build in the tower of uh, the world. You use your best ingenuity. You use your best thoughts. If you want to build something uh, in this kingdom that's great, you're going to use the wisdom of man. You're going to use the very best of the best. Uh, by the way, there are still many ziggurats that can be found, not just in South America, but also uh, throughout the Middle East. In fact, there is a ziggurat right in Babylon still. Um, it is, uh, it's not the biggest uh, ziggurat, but it's a, it's a big one. Um, it's called the Ziggurat of Ur, which is interesting because that's the land in which Abraham lived. Uh, it's in Babylon, which is in Iraq today. And uh, it dates back to 2100 BC, which is kind of interesting because it's pretty close to the flood. The flood was right about 2348 BC. Um, so the fact that it's within, um, within 300 years of when the flood happened, I'm not saying that's the ziggurat, I'm just saying it's from the same time period, all I'm saying, but it's still standing today. And in fact, Saddam Hussein actually tried to rebuild the ziggurat, um, and he actually used bricks in his, uh, the best bricks of his era. And in fact, every brick that he used to begin to rebuild this had his name stamped on it. And uh, so they began to build 100 feet of that ziggurat was rebuilt, or, or you know, because they had the ruins of it, but began to be strengthened by these bricks uh, during uh, Saddam Hussein's day. So it's kind of interesting. It's only about 100 feet of it uh, left today. But no matter how strong the building materials that are used in, in Babel, I want you to understand that God tells us it's just sinking sand, isn't it? Right? When you build on human ingenuity and you do the very best that you can think about, that just pales in comparison to the kind of materials that God can build for you when you build in the right kingdom. So let's compare that now uh, to building in, in Zion with Abraham because Abraham builds with truth. So uh, Nimrod uses human ingenuity and Abraham um, in this kingdom tells us to use um, truth, which is God, of course, is truth. He defines himself as truth. So uh, when a man Man builds on the bedrock of truth uh, of the Almighty God he's building in the right kingdom. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 10, I just quoted it. Here's what Abraham uh, is quoted as saying in Hebrews 11, 10. For he was looking forward to a city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. In other words, when you build in Zion, when you spend your life and all of your, uh, and all of your time focused on building in God's kingdom, 
You're using the truth to do that. Down in verse 12 of Hebrews 11, it also says, Therefore, from one man, even though he was as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of the heaven, as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. And I talked about last time, uh, it was I closed out last uh, time sermon on this subject. I said, look at the contrast between Nimrod. The only reason why someone remembers Nimrod today, for the most part, is to, is to use his name as some kind of insult. Uh, you're a moron if you're a Nimrod, right? Right? Uh, that's how we remember his name. But when we compare that to Abraham's name, I told you still today, in the 21st century, two-thirds of the entire world know Abraham's name. Because God made a name for him. And no matter whether you were a Jew or a Muslim or a Christian today, uh, you look back as tracing your roots to a man that God made a name for, and his name was Abraham. And uh, that's what happens when God makes a name uh, for you. And of course, the ultimate foundation that's in the kingdom of God is Jesus himself. Uh, Jesus said, uh, when the great uh, confession was made by Peter, when he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Peter, because you Man didn't tell you this, but my Father in Heaven told you this. And he said, upon that bedrock confession, upon that truth, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail. Uh, that's the kind of building when we build in the, in the, in the, uh, when we build in Zion. Um, it's the, the kind of stone that is said by Peter that the, that the builders rejected, which was Jesus, uh, which became the cornerstone. It's the kind of, same kind of stone that the Apostle Paul said um, was going to be the foundation to the spiritual kingdom, a foundation built by the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. That's the kind of building we do. There couldn't be more different materials. So no matter what you think, how you're going to outsmart God, how you have better ways than God has, that God's ways are antiquated. They're back in, uh, they, they don't apply anymore. But, but we, can, we need to figure out how to do this in the 21st century. Let me tell you something, my dear friends. You can't outthink God. You don't know more than God does. When God tells you to do something, you have one job to understand and do it. That's all it comes down to. And we can't uh, find any other way to, to come be more ingenious than God uh, already has. So our job is where are we building? We're we building God's ways in His kingdom. Are we building something that's nothing but sinking sand? Now move on from the foundation in our building components to the structure itself. Uh, Nimrod, back to Nimrod in the Tower uh, of Babel. His name, as I pointed out, means rebellion. And uh, there was a fresh start. I want you to think about the fact there was a fresh start given to Noah's clan. <laughs> the reason why the Apostle Peter said that uh, Noah and his family, eight souls and all, were saved by water. You hear that? He, they were saved by the water. You said, well, weren't they saved by the ark? Yeah, but you might say that, and I understand why that makes sense, but that's not what God said. God said they were saved by water. He said, well, how in the world were they saved by water? <laughs> because God had washed away all the evil out of the world. How long is it you're going to be able to stay righteous when there's maybe 660 million people and you're about the only righteous people on the entire face of the earth? How long are you going to become unscathed? Uh, aren't we worried today when we have kids and grandkids? Uh, uh, how are my kids? We're afraid to raise them up in today's society because of how society is going. How do you think it was in Noah's day when his family was the only righteous family? Right? But they were saved by water because God, God literally baptized the entire earth and washed away the sins of the earth and, and there was left uh, uh, Noah, Noah and his family. In Genesis chapter seven, uh, 9 verse 7, uh, they were given instruction when the boat came to land there on uh, Mount Ararat and they got off the boat after being on that boat for an entire year. In Genesis chapter 9 verse 7, they were given instruction. He said, but you be fruitful and multiply and spread out over the earth and multiply it. And so Noah's descendants instead, under the leadership of Nimrod, had a different plan. Because look at chapter 11, verse 4. He says, lest we be scattered abroad the face of the whole earth. In other words, let's stay here. Let's circle the wagons. Let's build this tower. Let's make a name for ourselves. Lest we obey what God told us to do. Because that's scary to do what God told us to do. We don't want to be spread out because, well, we'll be vulnerable for spread out. But let me tell you. When you do what God calls you to do, it's better, someone once told me a good illustration, it's better to stand on the edge of your own faith, pushing yourself as far as you can go, holding God's hand, than it is to be in the center far away from the edge with your own security. But when you build in the spiritual kingdom of God, 
That's what God is calling you to do. But that's not what they did. Those people refused God's order to spread out and multiply and fill the earth. Instead, they said, unless we would be scattered uh, over the face of the earth, we're going to stay here. Now, isn't there a modern day application for that, my dear friends? How is it that the church, instead of going out to go and preach the gospel, how is it that we hole up in our buildings as if this is the gate to God or something? That people have to walk through these doors as if they're the pearly gates or something they're walking through. You see, Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples. And so what do we do? We, we come up in our building. We worship and we go home. We worship and we go home. We worship and we go home. Where is the going? And if you think that, uh, that, that, that disobeying God's command to go and preach the gospel is not the same thing as Nimrod and, and Babel disobeying God's command to spread out, then I think you're deluded. That's what I think. But Nimrod and Babel, his name means rebellion, and they rebelled. But Abraham and Zion, in their hands, was characterized his building by obedience. Surrendered obedience and steadfast allegiance is what God is calling us to have in building the foundation and the structure of our tower in the kingdom of God. Again, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8 through 10. Listen to how the Hebrew writer characterizes it. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place uh, that he was rec uh, to receive an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. And by by faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. I want you to understand, it was not an easy thing when God said, Abraham, I want you to leave the land of your fathers, and I want you to go to a land that I'm calling you to, a land you've never been before, a land that's got foreigners, a land that's filled with people that don't like you and won't like you if you obey me. But he did it anyway. Why? Because God called him to do it. That's why he did it. And if you ask me, why am I doing something that God uh, asked me? My answer to you is, is plain and simple. Because God told me to do it. That's why I'm going to do it. I'm not going to do anything else. You can't convince me otherwise. Uh, believe me, I spent part of my life building in the wrong kingdom. I know what it's like. I know it's a, sh a sifting sand. I know it's all going to fall apart. And I know, friends, that if we're not building in the right place to the right foundation on the, with the right structure, it's all useless. As, as King Solomon said, it's vanity, all vanities, says the preacher to the congregation. We are called to build the city of God, friends. That's what Christians are called to do. Obedience brings about unity in the faith. We have a common confession that brings about unity. We have a God-given name. Acts eleven twenty six. 26, they were called Christians first at Antioch. You know when God first called them Christians? You know why it, it, it took God until Acts 11, verse 26, to first call them Christians there? Because that was the first time that Gentiles were added to the church in, in, in chapter 10. And God said that uh, the Messiah would come and, and, and he would be a king for all people, uh, Jews and Gentiles alike. And they will be given a new name. That's exactly what happened. And so the first 10 years of the church were Jews. And then when God allowed the Gentiles to come in, when he convinced Peter that it was time for the Gentiles to come in, the gospel had gone out to the Jewish community. And now it's time for the Gentiles. And they came together and it was the first Gentile church. God looked down upon this church full of Jews and Gentiles and he called them Christians, which are followers or disciples of Christ or little Christs. For the very first time he gave them a new name. What a, what a special unity that only God can bring. As I, I pointed to a second ago, Solomon, the prophet king, and sometimes fulfilled the role of preacher. He learned a lot of things in the world. You know, Solomon is most famous for his, probably his best decision he ever made, and that is to ask for wisdom from God rather than things. And he's known for that, known for his wisdom. But in a worldly sense, Solomon was known for his riches. Kings and other dignitaries from around the world would travel just to see Solomon because he was so rich and so magnificent and so many things that God had blessed him with. And, 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 the, and let me tell you something. If another king is going to come check you out because he heard how good it is, uh, because kings aren't necessarily known for being very humble, <laughs> but going to see somebody has, has a reputation of being greater, that you've got to just see it with your own eyes, that just says something. But Solomon let some of that stuff go to his head. And uh, he learned a lot of hard lessons uh, in the world. And you can see it most clearly when Solomon was chosen, given the benefit of building the temple, the very first temple. Literally building, right? The very first temple. He took seven years to build his temple. Guess how long he spent building his own house? Thirteen years. Almost twice as long. You are already, I mean, you've got to be asking yourself a question right now. Wait a minute. He spent twice as long building his own house than God's house? 
Something's wrong in Solomon's life. Solomon, you better wake up. You're not following your wisdom too, too good right now. But here's somebody who learned a lot of stuff. And here's what he says at the end of Ecclesiastes. In chapter 12, verse 13 and 14, listen to these words. He says, The end of the matter, and all has been heard. Fear God, keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Listen to the wisest man that God has ever lived and will ever live. Listen, I'm going to read it again. Fear God and keep His commandments. This is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment and every secret thing, whether good or evil. Which brings us to the third point. Because you're going to be building your towers. You're going to be building them in Babylon or you're going to be building in, in Zion. And the difference, the there's a difference in cause, difference in motivation, there's a difference in materials or, or components of truth and obedience. And now we're going to look at the consequences because Solomon warned us that all of this is going to be judged. Every deed, every secret thing, whether good or bad, God is going to judge. And I want you to know, my dear friends, I would, I'd be a poor preacher if I did not tell you what God says about how he's going to judge. The tower you are building of your life, whether your towers of your own life or collaborative towers with other people, that tower is going to be judged one day and is either going to be judged a majesty or a mess. And every man's tower will be judged. Listen to the apostle writing to the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This, this, this passage may take a whole new meaning on to you. I want you to listen to what he says. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. And let each one take care how he builds on it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold or silver or precious stones or wood, hay or straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. And if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. In other words, your, 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 a lot of your towers could come crumbling down, and you'll be judged too. So in other words, uh, you, 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 just because some of your towers fall down doesn't mean you're automatically disqualified, but you too will go through the fire. You too will be tested to make sure uh, you are uh, of the faith. But he says we're all going to be judged. All of our building is going to be judged one day. And so, where are you building? Let's, let's contrast the consequences now of these two kingdoms. Let's begin with Babel. Building in Babel is united we fall. United we fall. In chapter 5 of Genesis 11, it says this. The Lord came down. I love this imagery. Because again, the Lord doesn't have to come down anywhere. But they're building up. God says, okay, I'm going to come down. I'm going to check it out. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower. I want you to remember those two things. Which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people. And they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. How can God say so uh, categorically? Well, of course, He's God. But remember, this has already happened. <laughs> there was a pre-flood, right? Right? And all the things that man did resulted in a tower that only had eight people building in the right kingdom. And everyone else, millions and millions upon millions, hundreds of millions of people building in the wrong kingdom. And God says that they all come together and, re and are allowed not to obey me and don't spread out across the earth like I told them to. And they all stay here and try to build up, make a name for themselves. There'll be no limit to what they can do. And by that, he really means the evil, the evil things they can do. And he goes on in verse 6, and nothing that they have proposed to do will now be impossible for them. Verse 7, uh, come let us go down and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. And so the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of the earth and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the uh, Lord dispersed over the, them over the face of the earth. So guess what? 
They were not left with the option of continually allowed to disobey God. God said, I know you don't want to obey me, but guess what? You're going to obey me anyway because I'm going to make it impossible for you to stay together. And so I'm going to make it so confusing you can't even communicate with one another. You're going to go off in your little people groups, your language groups, and, and you're, going to be, you're going to disperse anyway even though you didn't want to do that. And so God's will. And there's a, if, if, if you learn nothing else through this series, I want you to know that God's will will be done. Uh, I, I said recently uh, that there's no such thing as a permanent unbeliever. <laughs> Because one day every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You may be allowed to disobey for a time. You may be allowed to, to build in the wrong kingdom for a time. But one day it's all going to come to an end. God's not going to allow it to go on forever. So man's babble is a lying pretension. See, they, they built this high tower to protect themselves from the flood. But that's just a false safety. What, God can't make the, the, the flood go over that tower too? How silly. <laughs> It's a false ambition. Reaching up to heaven, making a name for yourself out of brick and mortar. How ridiculous. False unity of disobedience. Lest we be scattered across the earth, we're going to come, become united. You see, when someone is trying to rally you to a cause, you must ask yourself, is this of God or not? That's your job and responsibility and will be your accountability to discern when, God, when people are trying to rally you to a cause, is this a cause of God or not? Because there are temporal things. When you build in the kingdom of Babel, it's just for a time period. The result is nothing. As, as Solomon said several times in Ecclesiastes, it's vanity all vanities, says the preacher to the congregation. So whether you're building it from Babel to, to Belshazzar, from Herod to Hitler... <laughs> It's all been for nothing. God has demonstrated repeatedly it does not pay to rebel against His will. That's why the Bible says pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Jesus said it like this in Matthew 23, 12. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. You see, there's a greatness in Babel that comes to humiliation. There's a greatness in Babel that comes to humiliation. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. So the pressure, the achievements, the alienation from your God-given purpose will result in nothing. But when you build in, in, in Zion, there's a greatness that, that results or, or comes to humiliation, and there's a greatness that, that uh, comes from humiliation. In other words, from humbling yourself. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. When you humble yourself, within yourself, to humble yourself, within your circle of people, within your church, and ultimately with your God, you humble yourself. The consequences and building in Babel are clear. God brought an end to an ambitious project by confusing the builder's language. And he scattered them all over the face of the earth. And so that human, uh, humanity's unity would not denigrate the, uh, back down to the pre-flood spiritual depravity they had resulted in. And so their temporary efforts, that unity that they tried to achieve based on, you know, external things resulted in a colossal failure. It truly is a united we fall. And then finally we turn to the, the building of Zion. Building in Zion. It's not united we fall, it's united we stand. And so there were uh, consequences because of external building. Now we're going to talk about eternal build, building. Consequences of the kingdom of Babel is that it would not be an eternal kingdom like Jesus' kingdom. Listen to, however, how God brings us about. In Zephaniah, Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 9 through 13, I want you to listen to the prophecy about how God is going to take what happened in Babel and he's going to restore it back to the way it should be. Listen to these words, Zephaniah 3, 9. For at that time, talking about the kingdom, Christ's kingdom, the Messiah's kingdom, I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. That's unity. From beyond the rivers of Cush, uh, which is Egypt, I mean uh, e uh, Ethiopia, my worshipers, the, the daughters of my dispersed ones, listen to them, the daughters of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. And on that day you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. That's a, that's a jab at, at, at uh, Nimrod. 
For then I will remove from your midst your proudly exultant ones, and you shall no longer be haughty on my holy mountain, but I will leave in your midst a people, humble and lowly. They will seek refuge in the name of the Lord. And those who are left in Israel, they shall not, uh, sorry, they shall do no injustice and speak no lies, nor shall they be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue. For they shall graze and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. You see, Zion is a restoration of divine order. The kingdom, the spiritual kingdom of God, of which God is calling us all to build in, is a restoration of that which was destroyed by the world. It's not, the, 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 um, the uh, imagery should not be lost on you that in Acts chapter 2, verses 9 through 12, it says there were Jews from every nation of, under heaven. All, Jews from every nation under heaven had come to this one place, into Jerusalem, for Pentecost. And it says that when the apostles stood up and were filled with the Holy Spirit, they began speaking in languages of which they had not studied, but the languages of the people who were listening. And listen to what in verse, uh, I think it's verse 11, it says, it says, we hear them telling in our own tongue the mighty works of God. And they were all amazed and were perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? It means that divine order has been restored. That which was forfeited and God had to purposely confuse to destroy the worldliness has been restored in the spiritual kingdom of God. And the only righteous place for you to build is in that place. It's remarkable that the beginning of the kingdom of Christ, the true city of God, which spreads over the whole entire world, that the the Spirit bestowed a gift of tongues. The purpose of a gift of tongues was to show that babbling had ceased and that we could all once again communicate with one another. Isn't it, isn't it obvious that the demonic teaching of that uh, tongues in the church is some babble, some ecstatic tongue that you just, blah, 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 blah. You, you heard people speaking in tongues, right? What they call tongues today. Is this language no one can understand? It's, it's a doctrine from the pit of hell because it undermines, it's Satan's attempt to undermine exactly what is restored in the kingdom, which is not Babel, but clarity. It's understanding and comprehension and righteousness and ultimately unity based on the Spirit of God. What a, what a, what a modern perversion that, that has become. But Jesus and unity, Jesus knew that people contribute their uniqueness to churches and it makes them stronger. When you look at uh, 1 Corinthians 12, I don't have time to unpackage that, that passage, but look at the whole chapter. He says, every person God put in the body just as He desired. And every, every part of the body, every single one of you, every living stone that's here today is part of the kingdom of God and just as valuable of a part as every other part in the kingdom of God. And the spiritual collaborative tower that is the church that we build here as a congregation is supposed to be one where everyone contributes their unique gifts to the common good. That's what it's about. It's about unity. I mean, look what Jesus did. Jesus took a tax collector and fisherman and a woman who was a prostitute at one time uh, was possessed with seven demons. He took up, some were poor, some were wealthy, and some were energetic, some were kind of uh, more subdued and passive. Some were explosive like Peter. Some, uh, like James, were a little more logical. But the fact is, Jesus took this ragtag bunch of people who couldn't be more different and put them together as a, in perfect unity based upon the truth in the spiritual kingdom of God. And that's why Paul writes to the church in Colossians 1.13. He has delivered us, listen to these words, He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption. In other words, we've been purchased back with a price and the forgiveness of sins. You see, the consequences of building in Babel is confusion, is division, it's, it's eventual destruction. But when you build your towers of your life, 
and empowers your building with others in this life, in the kingdom, the spiritual kingdom of Zion, the kingdom ba based on truth. It's about gathering the dispersed. It's breaking down the things that, that divide us. It's uniting the divided and restoring order to the confused. And so I leave you with this thought this morning. Where are you building your tower? Where are you building the towers of your life? Your marriages, your families, your church, your community. Where are you building? Will you be a son of God or merely a son of Adam? Will you be building the dark kingdom of Babel or will you construct your towers in the illuminated kingdom of God's beloved son? You know, it's interesting. Um, I, I do want to read this. So I'm going to bring this down here. I want to close with a, an illustration from the Bible about this very thing, because it's interesting. 1,500 years after the Genesis 11 account there in Babylon, 1,500 years later, in the kingdom of Babylon, there was a king. And his, the king's name was Nebuchadnezzar. You can read about King Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel. And King Nebuchadnezzar um, got really full of himself. King Nebuchadnezzar was actually used by God to judge his own people. And because he had so many victories, he began to start to think that he himself was God. I want you to listen to the words of Daniel 4, verses 28. It says this, All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And the king answered and said, he's talking to himself, this is not great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty. And while the words were still in the king's mouth, in other words, while he was still talking, there was a voice from heaven. O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And you shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and for seven periods of time, that be seven years, shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he wills. Immediately, the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men, and he ate grass like an ox. And his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers, and his nails were like bird's claws. He was walking through Babylon one day, saying, Man, aren't I great? Look at this thing I built. Hasn't this all been built for my own majesty? Exalt myself. And while he was thinking those things and saying those things, God said, um, I think you're mistaken. And immediately those words were fulfilled. And literally, he began roaming around for seven years like an animal. He was out of his mind. God brought to him the greatest humility you could probably think of. From what seemed to be a king, by many people's estimation, now he's just a madman. And uh, it's believed, actually, this is not directly scriptural, but it's related to scripture, that perhaps that Daniel being second in charge actually probably kept Nebuchadnezzar from being killed. Because think about it. When, in, in, when you're building in the kingdom of Babylon, when you're king, it's not necessarily the safest place in the world. Because <laughs> everyone else wants to be king, right? So they're always coming after your head. What's going to happen if you're out of your mind for seven years? They're coming for you, right? So why wasn't he deposed? Because he actually remained king during those seven years. No one, no one took his place for those seven years. Well, let me tell you what happened. Um, I'm now reading the very next verse, verse 34. At the end of the days, I, this is, this is, this is not Daniel writing anymore, this is Nebuchadnezzar. I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will amongst the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can say, a stay his hand. 
You see, there's one word I'm going to leave you with today. The one thing that changed the complete outcome of Nebuchadnezzar's life. And that word was repentance. He puffed himself up, but as the, as the proverb says, pride goes before the destruction, before the fall. God humiliated him. For seven years he served that. But then he lifted up his eyes to heaven. And God restored him. And you, you see a, a different attitude, don't you, in Nebuchadnezzar? <laughs> no longer is it, hey, look at me. <laughs> it's, hey, look at him. That's what repentance looks like, friends. It's no longer, hey, look at me. Look at us. It's look at him. And you can cease your building in the wrong kingdom today with one word, repentance. Starts with repentance. No longer trying to make a name for yourself building with your own materials, using your own ingenuity, your own ideas, but the truth of God's word focused on the fact that you want to build something that's going to last forever and not something that's going to all be destroyed one day because it won't pass the test. You know, it's interesting. I, I was kind of convicted here in the last couple weeks just talking uh, to some fellow preachers that I think somehow um, we of the Lord's Church have become a victim of so many people in the world not teaching immersion for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so we're sometimes so focused on getting people baptized that we jump over repentance. You see, baptism is important because it is the place where our sins are forgiven. If, if, if Peter is correct, if it is for the forgiveness of sins, which means we're lost because of sin. When our sins are forgiven, that's what saves us. And it's for the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is God living in us, to help us build in the right place. To build with His strength, not our own strength. If God has got that right, and, that, and, that's, and that's correct, baptism is a result of our repentance. Because it's not about what we think, or whether we think it's a good idea for God to do it that way, or whether we agree with God doing it that way or not. It's just saying, okay, God, I understand what you're, say you're saying. Yeah, when your son said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved, I understand that. I can do that. And repentance says, I'm going to do it. And when you say, I'm not going to do it, you, you're, you're being clearly to many people, maybe not yourself, that you're not repentant. But we can't just jump over repentance and, and jump in the water and think we can come up out of the water and, and, and uh, now that we, we got dunked in water, now all of a sudden gonna be, everything's going to be different. Because if you don't repent, nothing's going to be different. The good news is now you have the strength. And that's what I was teaching in Sunday school this morning. You see the difference. Christians don't change by willpower. Hey, because repentance is not willpower. They're not the same thing. All you do in repentance by your will is agree to participate with the change. The strength comes from God, not from you. And that's where we blow it. And we think, I can't do it. Well, you're right. You can do it. If you could do it, you wouldn't have to come to Jesus to begin with. So if you've not yet repented, I'm calling to you to repent. And unlike baptism, which is a one-time thing, repentance is a continual thing. We started it, that's why we were baptized, but we repent every single day. We're changing every single day. And when you tell me you don't want to change, you're telling me you don't want to repent. <laughs> I'm just preaching to you and I'm mad at you. Make sure you're building in the right place. Because one day... That building is going to be tested. And don't, don't point the finger at me. Because I've told you everything I know about it. Because I want your building to pass. I want your marriage to pass. I want your family to pass. I want your church to pass. I want the, the community to pass. But we've got to be building in the right place with the right materials. Okay. If you're not yet in Christ, you've not repented, you've not been washed of your sins, come do that today. Because there will be a judgment day of your own tower, and only one kind will stand. Let's all stand. God, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for the promise you've given us, and I pray, Lord, that you just open our heart this morning. And God, that your word would just permeate our mind, and, and, and right now we would just 
allow you to change us. Change our mind, change our heart, align our will with yours, and therefore our actions will begin to match up with the things you're calling us to, God. Humble ourselves. Help us not to have to be humbled like Nebuchadnezzar was, and certainly not like every single human being will be humbled one day if they don't humble themselves today. God, we don't know when that day is. It could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be in a hundred years. We, we don't know. But we don't have to worry about it if we repent today and obey today. God, thank you for your word and how it just strikes right at our heart. God, we know these things are true. I pray we would just act like they're true and let you change us, Lord. We thank you for these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.